Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure to be on stage with two of my favorite people in the whole world. They're both beautiful writers, creative intellectuals, and fearless defenders of science and reason. Well, I'd like to start by asking both of you, both of you, Anne and Richard, write poetically. You write science with great clarity, but many scientists and science writers can write with clarity. In addition, you write with great feeling and emotion, and with an uncanny ability to connect to readers emotionally. And Richard, I know you've written about how your upbringing, your education involved formal education in poetry, or a lot of exposure to poetry, and that that helped you in your writing. And I would just like you to talk a little bit about that aspect of your writing. Well, both aspects, the, clear, the clarity part, the explanatory part, and the emotional connection part. I think clarity comes first, and I think that science is so wonderful that you, you really, I mean, as long as you explain it clearly, the, the, the poetry should come automatically. I've even described science as the poetry of reality. Um, I suppose you're right that I have assimilated a fair amount of poetry in my life. Um, one of the things about an Oxford education is that you have to write an essay every week of your life. Uh, and um, so you get pretty used to it. And I, I, I loved that part of my education. I enjoyed that far more than lectures or practical classes. Um, I loved the discipline of being sent into the library each week to read up a topic and then write an essay. And I really tried to write well. I'm, I'm not sure I could dignify it as poetically, but I tried to write well. I tried to write clearly. Um, I suppose students of my books will d discern the occasional purple passage. <laughs> I try to limit them <laughs> somewhat. I, I've gone on record as saying that the Nobel Prize for Literature ought yes. to be given to a scientist. Yes. And um, I've been accustomed to saying that if ever a Nobel Prize for literature, for literature should go to a scientist, it should have gone to Carl Sagan. And, um, um, but um, it, it, it is, I think it's true to say that science is, the, is it, almost the ultimate vehicle for poetic writing. It's not clear to me why the Nobel Prize for Literature always goes to a novelist where novels, after all, are about things that didn't happen. How about, <laughs> how about a prize for writing about things that did happen? <laughs> and then you and your late husband, Carl, both had that un common and uncanny skill to write in a way that connects with readers about scientific reality and issues. Tell me, was, did, did, is that a natural thing with you? Did it, how did that, that arise with you and him, if you want to say? Well, <clears throat> as Carla always used to say, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And I think that was the thing that motivated us from the very beginning. Uh, I, grew, I did not go to Oxford. I did not you know, have that kind of education. I grew up in Queens with parents who were, who were passionate about literature. They were not, my dad uh, had a, a business in the garment district, but he would read uh, Shakespeare to me. And, uh, and my mother was a, a kind of thwarted genius who wrote numerous novels that she never showed to anyone. And so, but they inculcated me with this passion, not only for literature, uh, but also for reality. And I'm so grateful to them. And so when I write uh, about science, I do it as a non-scientist, as an outsider. 
who wants to be a bridge to the wider world. Um, my inspiration for uh, this new season of Cosmos that'll be on next year was what Albert Einstein said at the opening of the 1939 New York World's Fair. I happened to stumble on this, uh, watching, looking through YouTube, and he said, science will only fulfill its mission as art has already done when its inner meaning permeates the consciousness of everyone. And so it's that democratic ideal that the beauty of nature and science's awesome power to reveal that beauty that's so much greater than any story that anyone ever made up is the thing that really inspires me. So when I'm, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm a hunter-gatherer of stories in the history of science and about nature. And so when I discover them, I know if I understand them, and they excite me and thrill me and move me, then everyone else, many other people will feel the same way. And Richard, you've written about scientists need to uh, reclaim words like awe uh, in, in re yes. reference, reference to nature. We need not to turn our back on the emotional embrace of our understanding of uh, Yes, I, I, I do feel that very strongly. I, I, I worry a little bit about overusing words. They can become cliches. I mean, awe is still okay. Awesome is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Y yes, I, I, I think that's, that's right. Um, I was going to say something else. What was it? Um, it'll, it'll, it'll come to me in, in a moment. Um, that, that, that quote from Carl Sagan, you said, he said, when, when you're in love, we want, want to, to tell, tell the, the world. world. When you're in love with science, is what he said. Yes, yes that's, that's what he meant. Yes. He, he meant, you know, that feeling. It, you know that when you fall in love, you just want to, you want to tell the world. And he yeah. fell in love with science. Yes. Uh, at that same... World's Fair, that Einstein uh, said those, that, that quote. And for the rest of his life, he just, part of his mission was to share with absolutely everyone its power. Ken, I forgot what your question was. was it, uh, perhaps you've forgotten too. About all. Yes, I think that's, that's probably said enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I do think it's obviously important and, and as I said before science is the poetry of reality and um, so we, we do need to oh, yes, I remember what I was going to say um, uh, when people talk about um, popularizing science they often emphasize the practicality of it the usefulness of it which of course is important but I prefer to emphasize the poetic aspect of it and I, I've coined a, a contrast between two approaches to popularizing science. There's what I call the non-stick frying pan approach, <laughs> which is, which you, you, you get from justifying the space enterprise by saying, well, it, we got non-stick right. frying pans as a byproduct. And I think that's a bit like saying, justifying music because it's good exercise for the violinist's right arm. <laughs> <laughs> The contrast to the non-stick frying pan approach is the Carl Sagan approach, where you'd emphasize awe, you emphasize poetry, you inspire people. And I think that children, above all, yes. can be inspired by the wonder of it. Uh, there's a book, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's a lovely book for, of science for children, um, where the, the author advocates the following exercise. He says, take the children out into a large say, football field, and place a soccer ball in the middle of the field, and that's the sun. And then to scale, you walk, whatever it is, 20 yards, and you, and you place a, a pinhead, which is the earth. I may have got the scale a, bit, a little bit wrong. And then about an inch away from that, you put a little tiny grain of sand, which is the moon. And then you walk... Um, 
I don't know, a couple of hundred yards to get to Jupiter, and you put a, you put a I don't know, baseball, say. I come now, I've got the scale wrong. And then pick up another soccer ball and walk to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, and walk 2,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> now, that kind of exercise inspires children. They love it. I've actually done it with a, a class of school children in Scotland, and they just loved it. And I think that's so much more inspiring than saying, oh, science is so useful because it teaches you how to boil an egg or something like, like that. Right, right. And uh, well, I want you to tell us, each of you, about uh, several of your most recent works. Uh, we'll get to Richard's Outgrowing God. But you uh, were co-writer of the original Cosmos, and then writer and director and co-producer of the second one that aired in 2014 Thank you. Thank with you. Neil deGrasse Tyson as a narrator. And, and I, I, uh, on the way here uh, tonight, just an hour ago, uh, we spoke to our cab driver, and he, we asked him about, he, he, he has started watching Cosmos reruns of it about in the last several weeks, and is just loving it. Great. And he's so glad it's available this way. And uh, the first thing he said to us, by the way, was evidence. He loves evidence-based thinking. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's he, he wanted to come join us at this event. I wish he could have come in with us. <laughs> uh, but tell us a little bit about your involvement in all of these enormous projects. Uh, you worked with Contact, you worked with the original Cosmos with Carl and your writers and producers. Then you became the more lead person for the subsequent ones, and there may even be another one, right? Yes, actually there'll be another one next year. We <laughs> finished it, and it's called Possible Worlds. And, um, it, you know, it, it's called Possible Worlds because it's, it's not just the exoplanets that we might, might you know, one day explore, um, but it's also the possible world on this planet. It's the lost worlds of ancient civilizations and the world within, the world within the brain. Um, I'm very excited about it. it uh, I'm very lucky to have had brilliant collaborators, uh, including Brandon Braga and Seth MacFarlane. And, uh, and I'm just, uh, you know, really thrilled that we will be in 170 plus countries. Um, and there's a companion book, which I've written. And, you know, the whole story of, the whole dream of Cosmos is the idea that people would cease compartmentalizing the spiritual life that they lead, keeping a set of ideas within their hearts, and then, you know, appreciating the gifts of technology and doffing the hat once in a while to science, but science being something that was maybe 40 minutes a day in school and taught by someone who was afraid of the questions that would be asked by the students and not really the kind of passionate enterprise that it can be. And so the dream of Cosmos is exactly what you were saying about the driver, is the idea that we would take what science is telling us to heart. Because if we could do that, if we could actually come to grips with our true circumstances in the universe, take that pale blue dot image and look at what Richard was talking about, the scale of the cosmos and the fact that we are not at the center and it was not made for us and that our tenure here on this planet is very much de dependent on our ability to come to grips with reality and to take it to heart and to really act, to awaken from the stupor that we find ourselves in with this great shadow on our children's future and our grandchildren. And so 
the stories that we're going to tell in this new season of Cosmos have something in common with the previous seasons in that they're the stories of people for whom it mattered what was true. Not an absolute truth, not a delusion that uh, we can know those absolute truths, but those beautiful, precious, tiny approximations of reality that science gives us. And so what I'm most proud of about the book and the new season is that we are going to tell you stories of people that I guarantee you've never heard of. And yet, they have contributed so much to our understanding, and in, in some of the cases that we, of stories we tell, even to the, a willingness to give up their lives. And I think we, we need hope for the future. We need a vision of the future that we can still have. And we also need to appreciate the redemptive power of science in its ability to undo some of the traps that we've created for ourselves. And so that's the dream of possible worlds, our new, our new season of Cosmos. And In, in speaking of reality, uh, Richard's new book is called Outgrowing God. And now, as I understand it, Richard, you initially envisioned this, or maybe you still do envision it, as a, 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 a chance to write a, a version of your book, the, great, the God Delusion, your great book, The God Delusion, for, for younger people. But I have a feeling that it's going to appeal to people of all ages. I hope so, yes. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 the idea was originally a children's book, an illustrated children's book, sort of for eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds kind of thing. Um, the publishers didn't want that. Uh, they pushed... <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine why. Um, they, they wanted, a, they wanted a, a book for older people, so we kind of compromised on sort of 15-year-olds. And so it... It's a book for, it's called the YA market, the young adult market. <laughs> um, but uh, what's good for young adults, as you say, is really good for everybody. And so, um, amazingly to me, some people have said the God delusion is a bit hard to understand. No. But I don't get that. <laughs> uh, but um, if that's true, then uh, outgoing God might be, might be the answer. But, but this is supposed to be a conversation, so I'd like to have a bit of a conversation, if I might. Please. Um, right. Uh, Ask away. I mean, rather than just alternate questions to, to us. Yeah. Which, um, uh, I, love, I love Contact. Oh. Um, it's a wonderful novel. And it's, I think it's, um, it's, it's certainly one of my favorite science fiction novels, um, partly because it gets across the idea that if we were ever to be invaded, by an alien civilization, then it would, it would not be physical bodies. Right. They, that's far too improbable. It would be by radio, and the only way that they could, as it were, dominate us, take, take, take over us, would be to somehow induce us to build a computer program um, to carry out their wishes. So that, that, that's one um, excellent feature of the novel, which, by the way, it shares with Fred Hoyle's A for Andromeda. Mm. It has the same plot. I don't know who had it first, but I mean, other than that, it's very different. The, like all Fred Hoyle's novels, A for Andromeda has an obnoxious hero. Uh, mm. Paul was certainly modeled on the author himself, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, whereas the, the heroine of Contact is delightful. By the way, is she Carolyn Porco or... or, or no. Or Jill no. Tata, or neither. 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 Okay. Neither. Okay. I didn't. I actually. Well, I didn't know Jill before no. we Carl did, but I. The, my part was, was the emotional parts and the kind of yeah. the. the um, and so no, and in fact, uh, it, uh, it was. I'm glad you said that because our motivation, right after we finished writing Cosmos was uh, we were inspired by Hypatia, yes. who was the hero of the first season of Cosmos. She was a philosopher and a mathematician, 
and uh, she was murdered uh, at the behest of Cyril of Alexandria in 415 uh, AD. And we were so in love with her that we wanted to create a great adventure in which the men would stay home and the women and this woman would go forth. And in fact, Linda Obst, who produced Contact, is in this audience. And she was a collaborator with us on the, in the very beginning of this whole adventure and stuck with it until, until the completion of the movie. And so this was in 1979, six years before the novel. And so I'm very proud of the fact that, uh, first of all, Carl, who was uh, an enlightened person and who, uh, who was a great uh, fosterer of all kinds of, of opening, the, uh, tearing down the walls that made science so exclusive mm -hmm. and so excluding of, of, of women and uh, of, of, of people of color. And he really uh, felt that very strongly. And so we were partners in this idea of creating this adventure with uh, Eleanor Arroway, Eleanor for Eleanor Roosevelt, and Arroway, because that was Voltaire's uh, real name, Arroway. We spelled it differently because we loved the idea of the Arroway, of uh, the arrow on its flight. And, um, and so that was really the inspiration. Well, that's, that's good. But the, what I wanted to go on to is that what's wrong with the book? Is it soft on religion? You, <laughs> you, well, the you, book is not as soft on religion as the movie. No, that's true. Yes. Um, but, um, I mean, yes, please the, I mean, this, this vicar character who, who is treated with such sympathy. Yes. Um, um, and yes. Um, the, you, the, the real listener or the reader is left with a feeling that somehow the authors are soft on religion, which of course you're not. And then there's that, that wonderful um, final idea of God's signature being in, in, pie. in pie. And so right. I, I'm, some of, no doubt many of you have read it, but, but what the heroine does is to calculate pi out to the umpteenth, not decimal place, binary place, and then lay it out on a, on a matrix. And you have a field of zeros with a circular, a circle of ones div divided by a diameter of ones. So God wrote his signature in mathematics, right. in the, in the, in the, in the yes. fundamental constant pi. Well, obviously what you're doing with that is to say, if there was to be any evidence for God, right. it would have to be something like that. Yes. But didn't you fear that readers would come away with the idea that you're somehow endorsing God when you did no. that? No, let me say a couple of, so these, it's wonderful that you raise these. Uh, for one, we, I think Carl also felt this very strongly and I think this was, key to his remarkable effectiveness is that it seems to me that you cannot change people's minds by making them feel stupid. Making them feel? Stupid. And you cannot... I never, I never quite understood that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You cannot connect with another person who may hold a completely different worldview than you do if they are defensive or fearful. It's, the idea was not to punish the people who didn't believe the things that we believed. The idea was to, for Ellie Arroway to keep absolutely true to her belief system, but at the same time, to make contact, another way in which we hoped that the title worked, with someone who was completely different from her and had a totally different view. And I think we gave her the best arguments, and we didn't I think you him. did too, but he patronized her, didn't he? In the movie, I think a little yeah. bit more than in the book. <laughs> I think in the book, I know, I, you know, I have to reread the book, but the pie, the whole idea of pie came out of my junior high school trauma, which is the reason I didn't become a scientist or a mathematician, and that is because in, Queens in junior high school, 
when Mrs. Ramirez taught us pie, I began to have a religious experience. I began to shake. And I raised my hand, I was so excited, and I said, Mrs. Ramirez, is this true for every circle in the universe? And she said, don't ask stupid questions. What? And I burst into tears, which I was wont to do in those days, and I ran out of uh, the classroom. I didn't want to go back to school. And from that moment on, I was completely diverted from becoming, you know, I was really interested in, in, in mathematics until that's an that appalling moment. story that's it was an appalling story but we turned it we turned it into something good for you. that was really positive which is what you have to do in life yes is to just and so it was the inspiration for um for the idea and it's uh, a very clever idea it was, it's, it's, i thought so too yeah. <laughs> um, i would like you to tell us a little bit about what worries you most yeah. about the present state of public acceptance or non-acceptance of science and present state of knowledge about science. Well, I suppose this really is, is one of the reasons why I support CFI. I mean, that, what, what we're trying to do... Yes. Uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, raise awareness of scientific values. I mean, there is such a thing as truth, believe it or not. Um, there is such a thing as scientific truth. Um, evidence is, is what we use in order to discover scientific truth. Uh, and we ought to stand up and be counted for evidence-based truth, evidence-based <laughs> reality. And the... the the opposition to that comes not only from religion, though of course it does come from religion, it also, and from right-wing um, demagogues like, like Trump. It comes from, <laughs> as well, left-wing uh, intellectuals, who, some of whom are peddling the view that scientific truth is only one kind of truth, and there are other kinds of truth, and there's something patriarchal and menacing and white and male about scientific truth, which, as we just heard about Hypatia, this is bollocks. Um, and, <laughs> scientific truth is true whether you're black, white, green, male, female, what, any of the other genders which we're supposed to believe in nowadays. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I'm putting it a bit strongly, of course, but, but it, the opposition is so menacing and so um, really sinister that, that we do need to stand up and be counted for scientific truth, for reason, for logic, and for evidence. I don't think I have anything to add to that, actually. <laughs> well, I know you feel equally strongly about those matters because you've spoken so yes. and that, that appears in your, your uh, series. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that, you know, the scientific community has something to answer for also. Yes. Because it was. So, I mean, someone like Carl or yourself received tremendous... Uh, a disapproval, a disparagement for wanting to be a public scientist and to communicate with the public. And it was exclusive. And it did speak in a kind of jargon that was deliberately impenetrable for anyone who was not in it. And so when you go forth, or when Carl did that, it was, you know, to some extent, at, uh, it was a career risk. And science should never have been that way. It didn't start out that way with the Ionian Greeks um, That's of the ancient true. world. That's absolutely true. There's even something called the Carl Sagan effect, which is, which is not getting elected to the National Academy of Sciences yes. uh, because the scientific establishment is jealous of you. Yes, that was ex exactly uh, the truth of what happened. And, and, and he was not elected to the National Academy. Yes, this is an author or co-author of 600 peer-reviewed scientific papers. 
Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, when I remember what he said the day that that happened. He hadn't expected it. He had, he had no idea. He was literally blackballed from the National Academy, not just not elected to its membership. He was blackballed, which is even going a little further, but not yeah. for saying, for doing bad science, or for, in fact, he was such a good scientist that every week there's some new story about Mars or about exoplanets or about life that Carl actually played a role in. He was prophetic in many ways. Yes. So it wasn't his science. It was that he wanted, he wanted everyone to I think that's appreciate changing. And I, th science. I think, I mean, as you said, scientists are somewhat to blame for not going out into the, into the public forum. And enough. having contempt for the public, yes. too. But I think that is changing. Uh, and I think, um, I mean, I think there was a time, maybe it's still true, when the National Science Foundation actually required, as a, as a condition for getting a grant, that you should devote a certain amount of your time to publicizing what you were doing, yes. to explaining to the general yes. public w why it's important. And I'm not sure if that's still true, but I, but I think it should be true. And, and I should say, in defense of the National Academy of Sciences, that a few years later, they realized what they had done, and so they gave Carl the, their highest award. The Public Pu Welfare Medal. Yes. That, that, was, po that was, post post was was it? No, he was still alive. Oh, good, I'm very pleased. Yes, he was still alive, and you know, there were other honorees that year, mm. seven or eight people who were honored for a particular That's insight in science, mm. and they gave their acceptances, and then Carl stood up, and everyone was on the edge of their seat because they knew that they had wronged him and they were interested to see what he was, hear what he was going to say. And in the most poetic terms, he gave extemporaneously the real significance of each of the insights of the previous honorees in ways that were absolutely astonishing. And um, I look back on that evening and with such pride in the kind of human being he was, because uh, I think as great as his prodigious talents were in science and in writing and in communicating, uh, he, was, uh, he was a mensch. He was a human <laughs> being. Uh, his soul, really, and I don't mean that in the supernatural way, but I mean that in the, to, to indicate that kind of his persona was, um, was every bit as, 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 as remarkable as his many gifts. Um, Richard, you've written uh, recently a lot about courage in science. And in fact, I just heard you give a, a talk uh, at our conference this weekend uh, about the courage of Car uh, Charles Darwin but there are many others, too. And you end your new book with a chapter on, on courage, yes. as I recall. Yes, yes. Why does it take so much courage to be a scientist? Does it, why should it have to take that courage? Yes, I mean, it, it, it wasn't so much courage to be a scientist, but courage to accept the scientific view of the deep problems of existence. Um, the last chapter of Outgrowing God, which was kind of somewhat overlapping with the talk I just gave in Phoenix to the uh, SciCon con conference. Um, it does take intellectual courage to accept that the amazing complexity of life, the complexity of living organisms and the diversity of life could be explained by the ordinary laws of physics. And I think that one of the, probably the reason why it took so long for a Darwin and Wallace to come on the scene mid 19th century was that it never occurred to people that it was possible to explain the complexity of life on physical principles. Darwin and Wallace had that courage. Now, th that problem of life is now solved, but we're now left with the deep problems of cosmology, um, the origin of the laws of physics, the origin of the physical constants, the 
um, why is there something rather than nothing, which is the, the sort of last remaining redoubt where God is now hiding. Uh, the, 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 the last gap that science has to fill. And my point was that um, Darwin, ha having solved what I think of as actually a bigger problem, um, should give us courage to say, well, we may not quite know yet why there's something rather than nothing, how the cosmos started, um, uh, was there anything before the Big Bang, where do the laws of physics come from, and so on. The, those problems which remain, Darwin should give us the courage to say, yes, incredible though it may seem, though, even those problems will, will yield to the scientific endeavor. Um, I admit to finding it incredible that the whole universe should be explained and, and life and everything else should be explained uh, starting out from nothing. A very, or at least a very, very, very simple beginning. It's incredible, it's almost unbelievable, and yet we ought to believe it, we ought to have the courage to believe it. And I drew the analogy of seeing a really good conjurer, a really world-class conjurer, like Jamie Ian Swiss, say, or Darren Brown, or Penn and Teller, where you see a trick that you feel it's got to be a miracle. I mean, how could it be true? How could it, be, how could it not be a miracle? And yet, you know it's not a miracle. You know there's an explanation. And I feel just the same way on a larger scale with things like where the laws of physics come from. Um, how could it be that a random quantum fluctuation in nothingness could produce the Big Bang and then inflation and then galaxy formation and then the formation of the elements inside stars and exploding supernovae producing dust clouds, producing uh, and condensing to produce solar systems like ours, and then natural selection getting going, the origin of life and so on. That's such a hard thing to believe, and yet we've got to believe it. We need, we need the courage, we need the intellectual courage to, be, to, to believe it. What role do you think um, belief in religion has in impeding the flow of science and also the role in our current political situation? Yes. Yeah, so There's a fertile subject you have. <laughs> I'm, I'm more concerned, actually, about our current political situation. I, 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 yeah. I'm more concerned about it. I think. Uh, Matt, I didn't hear what you said. I say I'm more concerned about our current political situation oh, yes. because it represents, at a time when I feel that the fundamentalists are, are not as powerful, really, as they were even just 10, 15 years ago. I feel like their power is shrinking because I feel that there's, and I think there's statistics to bear this out, that there are more people who are willing to say they don't identify with any particular religion. And I feel that the thing that's so amazing to me is that, is that the idea that we could know that we have a president who's told 12,000 lies in the last three years, whatever the Washington Post figure is, and it, that could be acceptable. Now, only acceptable to, let's say, 40% of the people in the country. But I mean, how did our idea of the things that a president mustn't do completely vanish so that things that would get other presidents into you know, into such trouble that they would be impeached, no longer whole sway. And I think that the idea of magical thinking, the idea if you just want to believe, then you can believe. If you just wish hard enough, it can happen. All of those things, to me, are so frightening because unless you have that kind of foundation to say, that it matters what's true, and this is obviously not true, and therefore it's a danger to us, because if we, we are at such a critical stage in our technological adolescence that believing in this 
and, you know, I mean, the idea that our whole country has found it acceptable not to deal with, with climate change, uh, that our government not only is moving, uh, not, not just in the direction of trying to protect us from climate change, but fleeing in the opposite direction back to an even more destructive uh, uh, policy towards the environment. The idea that that, I mean, uh, that really amazes me. I can't get over it. I kind of feel that, uh, that we are kind of, we're sleepwalking. Even though we, you know, we've gotten to the point where we're willing to reject Trump, we haven't gotten to the point that Greta Thunberg is at, and yet I think we should be. And so I guess lacking a sense of reality, I think, is the gravest danger to us. I mean, the idea that people take refuge in the belief systems they were given by their families in childhood contributes to this. But it's not nearly as frightening to me as the idea that we are that we're all going quietly into uh, a time when, you know, I heard on CNN the other day, in 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Well, when I grew up, when I was growing up, the idea of the ocean was just, it was so vast and so filled with life. And the idea that you could actually poison the oceans to the point where there would be more plastic in them than fish was not even thinkable. And so I guess if there was, you know, I do believe that it's that magical thinking and that idea of a heaven elsewhere that makes this planet disposable, which potentiates this kind of disaster. But I think the question is, how do we awaken people and make them feel the urgency of our situation? Richard, you see our present problems from a little bit different vantage point. From the... No, I, I agree with all that. Um, I, I, I mean, Trump will be gone soon, and thank goodness. But, but um, yeah! yes. But, but I mean, what, what's more worrying is that is, is that the Supreme Court appointees that he's that yes. he's pu putting in will go on for a very, very long time, and and that's one of the that's probably the worst effect that he will have apart from his effect on. Um, climate change, which is, which is, I mean, his absurd uh, denial of, of, of what, what every scientist is, is saying. But the long-term consequences of Trump's re regime may be seen in, in the Supreme Court justices going on for decades from now. I agree, and not only that, but the complete destroying from within of every institution, whether it's the EPA, or the State Department, or the intelligence community, or any of it, it's absolutely across the board. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I, I wonder what you think, uh, Richard just addressed one long-term aspect of this that's unchangeable, the Supreme Court uh, nominee uh, uh, candidates becoming permanent. What is, do you see there, this is a temporary phase in human culture, or in national culture, uh, or do you think it's something that has danger of continuing long beyond the well, current continue presidential that long. candidate? It can't continue that long because it will prove fatal, you know, to our civilization before <laughs> very long. So it can't, I mean, you know, I'm... I'd love to hear what, what Richard has to say. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not American. I, I don't, I mean, we've got our own problems in Britain. <laughs> well. But, um, uh, I mean, the first thing we've got to do in this country is, is abolish the Electoral College. And that's a, 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 I totally agree. I totally agree. Make California's votes mean something. Huh? Yes, California, <laughs> New York, and a lot of places. A voter in Wyoming has 60 times the power of a voter in California in, in, in electing senators, for, for How example. How can that be right? It can't be. Well, it obviously isn't, but... but no, but I'm saying, I agree with you. I know you're right, but I'm just saying, I mean, it's so, so undemocratic. 
Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, Richard, you get, you get some interesting mail, do you not? You get some, you, you, it's not all no. favorable, is it? Tell, get, tell us a little bit about I, some of I, the I get, I get more fan mail for reading my hate mail <laughs> <laughs> than anything else. Um, I, I, I've, written, I've read my hate mail tw twice on YouTube, and I, 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 I thought I'd bring along a, a, a couple of recent yes. Oh, please. <laughs> I salute only Jesus. <laughs> when I was praying in depth with my prayer group, Jesus told me that you are the devil. <laughs> my fellow humble Christians said that when I was praying, I was floating, floating off the ground. That's proof that gravity is just a theory. <laughs> Just like evolution. <laughs> See how easy it is to prove you wrong. Why doesn't the moon fall down to earth if there's gravity? <laughs> I am not a monkey. By the way, I got another letter that said, if evolution is true, how come I just sat on my left ball? <laughs> Test how hot hell is when you hopefully die soon. <laughs> Bring your precious scientific tool so you can accurately measure it. God will smite you. I would have you burned alive, but I am a Christian. <laughs> and that's not what Jesus Christ would do. I would only do that if I was an atheist. You should be happy that I am not an atheist, because if I was, I would do horrible things to you. Wow. Have you ever had a cactus shoved up your ass? <laughs> That's only a taste of what I like to think about doing to you. You should be thankful that there is religion, because if there wasn't, we would come, we would come after you. You are a shit-eating fascist like Hitler. You can go burn forever in hell while Hitler fucks you. <laughs> you are the kind of person who would have eaten from the tree of knowledge. Well, that's a compliment. That's true. <laughs> you are the snake who tempted Eve. You tempted happy Christians into hell with your books and your videos of evil. Their blood is on your hands, Dick Dawkins. <laughs> God is not delusional, he knows everything. You are the delusional one. Just like a blind watchmaker can't make a watch, you can't make a person, only God could. Why don't you fucking realize it? Because you're a stupid atheist fag. <laughs> and I hope you die a horrible death, fag. Fuck you. <laughs> Hello, Dawkins. A few questions. Wanker, wanker, wanker. <laughs> Take that, bitch. <laughs> Fuck you, Dawkins, you pathetic leftist shill for Islam. Save the wow. NHS. Fucking destroy the NHS. Ridiculous NHS, that's National Health Service. Ridiculous I have to pay for old jihadists like you to get dental operations. Go suck Chowdhury's dick, you, you shill for Islam. And go rape Karl Mark Marx's dead corpse. F.A. Hayat forever, bitch. Someone who fucking hates your guts. But wow. I, I, got, I had a... I had another one which um, I, I had another one which appeals to me more than any of those. I must say, it's I hope you lose your watch and are late for an important appointment. Wow! <laughs> May I ask a question? So, where did they get the idea that you were an apologist for Islam? Oh, they love that idea. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, <laughs> um, I, I guess it must be because I, I attack Christianity, and so I must be um, an, an apologist for Islam. Um, I must say, yeah, that's a bit mysterious, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's time for us to take a few questions from the audience. I want, first of all, to uh, have you express your appreciation for Richard oh. Dawkins and Andrew. And I want to express our appreciation to you, Ken. Thank you very much. Very much. And to Robin, and to Jim, and to the center for could, inquiry, and really, the lights up, for what you do, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and the skeptical inquiry. My pleasure, thank you, sir. Is it possible to have the lights up so we can yeah, see you? Yes, so we can yeah, see we you. We can't see, see anyone. We, we can't see a thing here. Maybe not. <laughs> Is anybody there to we'll turn the light We'll imagine <laughs> Let there be light. Yes. <laughs> Falls on deaf ears. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, much better. Oh, this is great. <laughs> okay. What is a tactful opening sentence for people who insist that Jesus will fix everything that's wrong in their lives? <laughs> I think Anne and I may differ here. She, <laughs> she believes in tact. Um, <laughs> well, I, no, it's not tact. It's that I want to connect with that person. I don't want to leave that person feeling that nothing has changed because we've had this exchange. Yes. And I, I want them, I want to connect with them. And so if someone said that to me, I would say, I'm really interested to hear that you feel that way because I'm of such a very different opinion, persuasion, and uh, for me, the, the world is very different. And I'd love to know how you came to believe that because uh, I believe something which is antithetical to that, but I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. I really, honestly, it's not just tact. I truly believe that. Because I feel that, first of all, the thing that science teaches us more than any other single thing is humility, is our tininess, is the fact that you know we are so very young, so very ignorant. We know so little. And I think that if you really feel that humility, and you don't feel superior to that other person who has a completely different set of beliefs, then you have a much greater chance of, it's, you see, because there's an investment, there's a psychological investment in being right, which I think non-religious people have every bit as much as religious people have. But we have to wean ourselves of that in order to learn and in order to connect with each other. And so I would be, I, you know, there's no one single sentence, but I would approach that person with fellowship and with goodwill to find out where we could meet. I think that's our only hope. I just don't think that you can, you can, uh, you know, the, the thing about, about religion is that it is, tends to be hierarchical. And it tends to think in terms of, um, just it's hierarchical. Whereas I think the thing about science that gives it its power is that it's not, it's, you do have to pay the dues of learning something deeply in order to enter the conversation. But once you do, if you have the evidence, that evidence is, it makes you equal to anyone else in the field. And so that's what I aspire to, is to learn how to, exactly how to communicate. And let me just say one more thing. Mm -hmm. You know, in Cosmos, people often say to me how spiritual Cosmos is, and it certainly is. And I think rigorous and unstinting 
in its rejection of the supernatural. In fact, I hate that word, supernatural, as if it was above nature, when nature is everything. And it should be called, if we could do two things in our language, if we could call it the subnatural instead of the supernatural, and if we could stop using the word incredible as being synonymous with something great, it would be, you know, I think we tell on ourselves when we say that something really remarkable is incredible, when the idea that something credible is really what we're all searching for. That's really what we really, the idea that if something is credible, then it's much more valuable than the thing that's incredible. So, you know, our language, we tell on ourselves uh, with the, the words that we use. And I think there's a, a common language that we could share with people who don't see things the way we do. I think my answer would be a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would say, you're an ignorant fool, go away and read some stuff. <laughs> and you know, this may be the reason that I, you know, I was thinking when you were reading your hate mail, I have That's why I get hate mail, yes. Yeah, I have. <laughs> Do you know, up to this day, I have never received a single piece of hate mail. Now, that may be because I'm not doing something right. I don't know. But the fact is, I, I searched my memory. I have never received a piece of hate mail in all the mail that I get about Cosmos from all the countries on Earth. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the first time I met him, um, put the point pretty much the way Anne has, saying, saying to me, you're supposed to be the professor of public understanding of science, but all you do is just tell people this is the way it is. I mean, that's no way to persuade people. You should, it should be an act of persuasion. There should be an act of seduction. There should be an act of reaching out and all those things. And he was very eloquent about it and, and spoke very powerfully. And, uh, we were running out of time at the end of a session. It was in a, a conference in San Diego, and so I simply replied, I gratefully accept the rebuke, but I'm not the worst offender in this. And I quoted the editor of New Scientist, Alan Anderson, when I asked him, what is your policy at New Scientist? And he said, our policy at New Scientist is this. Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. <laughs> Two, two different approaches. Uh, <laughs> this uh, questioner begins with a quote from Carl. Oh, it's one of the most uh, telling and important ones, I, I agree. We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. How can we educate the global general public to accept the fundamental scientific principles that our universe depends on? And the questioner adds, he says, I believe your books and productions, both of yours, are a great start. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, that's the motivation for doing it. I'm well, in, in Britain, um, in 2016, we had the Brexit election, mm. and a leading politician, Michael Gove, said, the British people are fed up with experts. You are the experts now. Ignore what the experts say. You are the experts. What a damn silly thing to say. I mean, what a pernicious thing to say. And that's exactly what happened. Yes. The British people thought they were the experts. They thought they could ignore expert advice on anything. And they felt kind of puffed up with almost vanity. They're being asked to actually right. decide something important. And so they decided, and um, we've been wrestling with this awful problem ever since. It is nonsense to, uh, to deny that we have experts in our midst and we should listen to them. I th I'm not the only person who said if you, if you need an operation, you, you'd prefer to have an expert surgeon rather than just <laughs> pick somebody off the street. <laughs> uh, and if, you want, if you're going to fly in a plane, 
please let it be a trained pilot who is an expert. I am an elitist, an unashamed elitist. I want to be... I want to, I want to be living in a society where, we, where experts have their say, where we, where we listen to experts, um, and uh, I, I do not wish to be governed by somebody who you just feel you'd like to have a beer with. Yes, you are an elitist, but you want the people. You want to join the elite. Yes, exactly. you want them, to, do you want them yeah. to listen to, uh, to experts. And so the question And to is, become the elite. I mean, I, I, I want to get everybody to join the elite. Right. Yeah. And, and so that's the, that is exactly the question. Is yeah. How do you invite everyone in so yeah. they don't make these, uh, they make informed choices. I mean, the rest of what Carl was saying in that passage, which I remember so well, was that, you know, it, it's a recipe for disaster that any society that even aspires to be democratic, as, you know, even that we, you know, not that we are a democratic society, but we hope to be one, we at least say we want to be one, has to find a way to, uh, to, to educate the public and to, as Einstein was saying, to have them feel the inner meaning of science so that it's precious, as precious to them yeah. as it is to us. That's really the challenge of our society is for people to awaken to, I mean, the scientists, going back to Svante Arrhenius, but even just going back to the 1960s, the scientists have been making these predictions about climate change. And we, if you trace there, even before there was sophisticated computer modeling or as sophisticated as is now, they were so right, they were conservative in their estimations. So they are far more prophetic than any figure, religious figure that I've ever heard of, saying what the global mean temperature would be 60, 70 years in the future, and they got it right. And yet, you don't have this kind of feeling amongst the public of like, wow, that's where I should go to for truth. That's where I should go to to understand how to live my life and make decisions. And that's the challenge, is to inspire and awaken people to that. Uh, this one uh, question is for Richard. Uh, many of my Christian and religious friends say that atheism is also a religion, uh, just simply a different set of beliefs. What do you say to, to this question to religious people? I think it's rather silly. I, I, I've heard it before, of course. Um, I mean, so, of course, you can define words however you like, and you can define Marxism as a religion, you can define Nazism as religion, you can define um, patriotism as a religion, and to some extent, um, those things share, share um, the attributes of religion. I prefer to, re to reserve the word religion um, for uh, people who believe in some sort of supernatural god, some sort of divine creator who probably does things like read your thoughts and listen to your prayers and forgive your sins and things like that. Well, atheism is nothing like that. It's simply the absence of a belief in that, in that kind of thing. Uh, it's, been, it's been sort of said that it's equivalent to saying that not collecting stamps is a religion. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> or abstinence is a position. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I, I suppose that you that you could, if if, if I mean, a, a sort of militant atheist who goes around doorstepping people, knocking on their doors, and and says, "Are you unsaved?" <laughs> but we don't, on the whole, do that. I mean, we, 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 we stick up for things like science and reason, um, and we oppose religion where it has pernicious effects, um, as it does in the Islamic world, for example, and it does, as it does in, in um, affecting laws, that, that, like abortion laws and things which 
which um, have an impact on, on, on people. So we, we can get militant, but to call it a religion is, I think, is just a, a, a rhetorical trick which, which doesn't bear respect. And you have anything to add? I would just say that, you know, I don't know if the questioner was talking about the idea that an atheist as opposed to an agnostic is someone who knows that, the, you know, that there is no God. And so if they were, is that, if that was what they, because they couldn't mean that atheism is a religion in, this, in, the, in the ritualistic sense. No. No. So it must mean that you have a conviction that says that there is no God, which is a kind of knowing. In other words, I'm not talking about the intervening God. Uh, who's, you know, tallying the fall of every sparrow and, you know, punishing you for loving the wrong person or eating the wrong food. I'm talking about uh, the God, uh, you know, that, like, let's say Spinoza's God, who is the sum total of the laws of the universe, uh, the laws of physics. I mean, I think, you know, since we don't really understand, as you so beautifully described, the the origin uh, and evolution of the cosmos earlier in this evening. Since we, we, that is that last frontier, or actually I think there are many frontiers, but that is a frontier uh, limit to our understanding and our knowledge. Maybe the questioner was saying that, uh, you know, being an agnostic is saying, I, I just don't know what happened. And maybe that's less of a kind of uh, a religious, idea than being an atheist. I, I don't think anybody would wish to say, I know there is no God. I mean, I, I, I don't know there is no tooth fairy. <laughs> but that's different. The tooth fairy is, is so obvious. It's not different. It's not different. Why is it, why is it different? Because, the, because we just don't understand uh, how the universe came to be. We really don't. We know the story. We know we have a current scientific story which, like all scientific stories, will be subject to change. That's the revolutionary nature of science. We'll learn more. We'll modify the story. We'll add to the story. That's we'll take right. certain parts of the story away. Mm. But the fact is, is that it's still, you so eloquently described your astonishment, uh, the idea of, of all of this coming from, from virtually nothing. And so um, I think it's, you know, we, I'm not talking about the intervening God. I can't stress that enough. Not the tooth fairy God. But I'm talking about just not knowing how Spinoza's the God. Spinoza's yeah. God. Which, you know, by the way, Spinoza is a hero of, uh, of the new season of Cosmos. And uh, I'm just the idea that people will turn on their TV on Fox and, and, and suddenly learn the story of Spinoza is one of the great satisfactions of, uh, <laughs> of my job. It really makes, makes me happy. This next question goes to Richard, I, I imagine. It's a question on evolution or, or creationism, intelligent design, really. How can you refute the irreducible complexity issue um, you, you can explain. Irreducible complexity is not a phrase that Darwin himself used, however, he talked about it a lot. Um, it's the idea that uh, living things or certain aspects, certain parts of living things are too complex to have come about by, some say by chance, of course Darwin would never say that was not relevant, by, by natural selection. And things like the vertebrate eye, things like um, uh, the immune system. Um, it's an argument from ignorance. I called it the argument from personal incredulity. Uh, you, you say you, you have um, a, a problem to solve, like um, the, uh, the elbow joint of the lesser spotted weasel frog. <laughs> and somebody says, well, this is an incredibly complicated elbow joint. Um, Therefore, God must have made it. Um, it's as though you're, you're saying, here we have two rival hypotheses, um, the Darwinian hypothesis on the one hand and 
the God hypothesis on the, on the other. The Darwinian hypothesis has a massive amount of evidence for it from all kinds of sources in all sorts of other, uh, other places. But as it happens, nobody has worked yet on the elbow joint of the lesser spotted weasel frog. And so it's possible to say, well, the Darwinian hypothesis actually doesn't explain that. Therefore, God does. <laughs> Whereas there's not the slightest evidence for the alternative hypothesis at all. And no effort is made to explain it. It's a, it's a negative thing. It's saying, we failed to explain it on this hypothesis. Therefore, the other one must be right. The other one might as well be the, the hypothesis that, that a... That a Green, green dragon at the bottom of the sea made it, or something like that. I mean, it's, it's absolutely no explanatory value whatsoever. Now, the right approach to, to it is to say, yes, okay, we don't yet understand about the elbow of the weasel frog. Let's go to work on it. Yes. Let's put a PhD student onto it. Um, <laughs> and then, no doubt, we'll then be able to... Uh, to, to answer it. The argument from personal incredulity is pathetic. A question for Anne. Uh, do you still wake up each day thinking about being the person who placed what could be the first message from humanity on Voyagers 1 and 2? Every day, <laughs> every single day of my life. And I, there's really, I've thought about it, you know, it's been 42 years. God. And, and uh, I, I, never, I, I think about it all the time, of the crazy good fortune that I had to touch something that's the closest thing to immortality. That, I mean, the continents I agree. will have changed. Yeah. You know, if you were to a billion yeah. To five billion years, and remember, they said a billion to five billion years. The engineers who uh, created the record and its cover, and the spacecraft and its trajectories. Voyagers, both Voyagers, are still functioning 42 years later. It was supposed to. It was a mission that was supposed to last for 12 years. And do you know that last year, year and a half ago? They had to reorient Voyager 2 so that we could receive its signal. And so they fired up the thrusters on Voyager 2 for the first time since 1987. And I think, you know, the light travel time is something like there, there are something like 18 to 20 light hours away from us. And Voyager started right up. It did, the thrusters fired perfectly. Now, these are the same engineers who designed the record and its cover. And so, I'm leaning towards the five billion here. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, but I, I just have to say, these, these, these spacecraft will make something like eight circumnavigations of the Milky Way galaxy over that period. So it's just uh, the idea that, you know, the chances of it them being intercepted are very small. But one to five billion years is a very long time. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, especially because I'd just like to say that the day that my brain waves and heart sounds. I love the thought that when we're, we're all extinct, when humanity is extinct, there is this cosmic tombstone out there. Yes. Which, and, and not just a tombstone, but there's this faint, ever so faint possibility that somebody will again appreciate, I don't know, Shakespeare or, or, or our kind of music, our, our language. I mean, it, it would be one of the tragedies of going extinct is precisely that, that, we, that nobody will ever appreciate Shakespeare ever again. And this. The Voyager thing is, is just this faint possibility that gives one hope that some way, somebody will, dis, will decode it, dis, de decipher it, and realize that, right. that there was a civilization here, and, and at our best, we were very, very good. With that, I would like, again, to thank our 
two speakers, Anne and Richard. It's a great pleasure to share this stage with you. I hope you all have enjoyed this. I very much appreciate you all being here. Thank you.